Canon Films. The home of high power, high voltage, motion picture entertainment. With the screen's biggest spectacles, brightest stars, and boldest lineup of explosive entertainment. We're taking motion picture excitement over the edge and your box office over the top. Canon Films, and we're dynamite. I am not your prisoner. You are mine. What strange power does he possess? The cauldron of blood that makes his sculpture look more alive than the models who posed. excited uh, about watching this one because this is our first horror film yeah. that we watch for canon and I'm like oh Boris Karloff is in it and I'm like uh oh this is what's known as like the Boris Karloff 6 like the last six movies he made in his career he like signed some contracts and it was like four Mexican films and this Spanish one that sh- that sat on a shelf for three years because it was re- it was made in 1968 Wow. And was released in 1971. So this was obviously like a Canon Films pickup. Yeah. They didn't produce this one either. Yeah, I mean, do you know... Well, when we talk about right. Canon Films in this era, they've been picking up a lot of sexploitation. They've been picking up we weird be John G. Alvinson movies. Um, they- you know what? Maybe because it had been sitting on the shelf for three years, it was a really cheap pickup. Like, they were walking by and a distributor was like, oh, please, just buy this movie. It's yeah. like one of Boris Karloff's last ones. Basically, the film starts. He's going to Paris or something. To He's a photographer for Holiday Magazine. And then as he gets there, like, I don't know, like the stewardess or something like that is. No, actually, you have to go to this small town in Spain to see this sculptor because they're trying to make this a destination. And he's like... Sure, but in sort of a way that will establish his character in kind of a creepy way, because the, the stewardess has sort of everything out for him, and his reaction to that is something you could clearly only get away with at the time is to give her a playful stroke on the chin, which she smiles about and is like, "Oh man, I'm just meat to them." <laughs> But here are your tickets to the Costa del Sol and a time schedule. Your baggage has been taken care of, and there will be an auto at your disposal when you arrive. Uh huh. Now that's what I really call efficient service. <laughs> and this is how the film opens, which leads us into probably my second favorite thing in the whole movie, which is a groovy title sequence. Yeah, it's actually, it's probably like. I was really excited when I saw this title sequence. So we cut to the Spanish town. There's a beautiful lady selling herself on the rocks. It doesn't look that good a beach, to be honest. And then, sort of, immediately the title sequence, she turns into an animated skeleton. And then her animated skeleton explodes. And then, groovy 60s second day, like. words, Cauldron of Blood. Yeah. And with, like, sort of crazy smoke and tie dye and colors. And then Boris Karloff's crazy face and cloak red close up. It's kind of like, it's like. Set it out, you know, this, you know, this ain't your daddy's Boris Karloff horror film, Daddy O. You know, it's it's just trying to be like. And then I think the thing is straight after that, like, you know, we kind of. The, that that woman? No, um, <laughs> it's so hard to explain, but the gypsy, hunchbacked gypsy who works at the beach is then murdered. Yeah. So the movie kind of starts. I yeah. mean, we're already lost and we're not yeah. even five minutes into it. But there's like a gypsy hunchback that's like a setting Maho. up. Maho. Maho, the, the gypsy hunchback. This film is not politically correct in, in any way whatsoever. Um, and he's setting up like an umbrella and the woman is... It's very like weirdly cut to where there's like jump cuts and scenes. Yeah. This, this and he's is, setting yeah. um, an umbrella up. And he's like, oh, she's like, oh, thank you. And then she leaves. And then a, a kind of like giallo killer shows up. You don't see his face. Yeah. He's wearing a long jacket. No black gloves yet. And I, I got kind of excited and started making notes here where I'm like, oh, this is like a proto giallo. I mean, it was made in Spain. So technically it's not a real giallo because giallos can only exist in Italy, according to Troy Howitz, the guy who wrote a book um, so deadly, so perverse on giallos. But the first giallo came out in 1963. 
by Mario Bava called The Girl Who Knew Too Much. And the first real one, which is like a killer going around and killing people in like multicolored settings, was Blood and Black Lace in 1964. Mm. But like the Giallo, as most people know it, like Black Glove Killer yeah. and that kind of style, wasn't done until 1970 where Dario Argento did Bird with the Crystal Plumage. Mm. So I was getting kind of excited. I'm like, oh, this is going to be like a proto Giallo, like some guys going around killing people and it's going to be fun. Nope. Yeah, it, but it does have it does have that thing which is good in Jello movies, and I love it basically in any film with a murder, where before committing the murder, we see the murderer's hands, and he brings out his weapon and just plays with the weapon briefly to make sure it's going to work. Like they're always like in shot, hold a knife and stroke it, or hold their cheese wire and like go boing boing boing. Like, like I I love that. It's like it's like well, I'm about to do a murder. I better just publicly prepare my weapon. <laughs> and it's like broad daylight yeah. on the beach. Like someone could be like ten feet away and just be watching. And to spoil the movie, why does he murder this person? <laughs> okay, so we're gonna we should get into the meat. So basically, our, our photographer is here to take some photographs of this famous sculptor guy who's who's a recluse and all that. And uh, he comes into town, goes to the bar, blah blah blah, and he eventually make, has a meeting with. Uh, the sculptor who's played by Boris Karloff, Boris Karloff, who mostly just sits there quietly waiting goggles. Yeah, supposedly he had only one lung at the time, or half a lung, so he would have to take like oxygen after the takes, oh and my that's God. why he's always sitting down in the chair. And he also uh, meets his wife, who is disarmingly creepy, let's say, immediately. Um, and, and the mute servant girl. Yeah, and the mute servant girl. Who, who goes, uh! Yeah, yeah, she's... <laughs> Get out, I said! Get out! So, and the first thing, I mean, obviously our photographer is actually, he's, he's, he's a learned gentleman, and he refers to, like, a, pe- a paper, a piece from, like, 1931, which even at the time of the film is, like, 40 years earlier. And he's like, oh, they said that you used the actual bones of animals in one of your famous sculptures. And he's like, yes, I, d- I did, I, I did that. I once fathered a griffin. And you're like, what? What? Like, is he just mental or what? You are well prepared for this interview. Well, I'm indeed flattered. Perhaps you remember from that same series a group of bronzes called Fruit Song. The work consisted of a group of small goats in repose. So basically, what this means is, is that his wife and another character, you don't know who the other character is yet, are going around just murdering women and stuff so he can then use the bones as the armature in his in his sculptures because the way you make sculptures which should explain part of the film long after you have explained you've already picked it up um he sets up the bones then he puts on the the clay or whatever it is he's he's doing to to form the thing and then they they cast it in bronze or whatever right afterwards can i point out that it seems very weird the way they go about making these sculptures because it's not like he covers the bodies like they do in like a bucket of blood or something like that nope. it's like all he has is bones you yeah. might as well just use anything yeah man. It, it, it's true i was like and this... you have to put the bones back together because they're yeah. all like yeah. broken apart they don't have full skeletons or yeah anything. that's the that's the other thing is like they are murdering the people then they are melting the, the our cauldron of blood is a big bucket of acid basically, which they burn the bodies in, so the bones just come out unconnected in a pile. So they have to rebuild the skeletons of a dead person, right, um, to then make these. It is the least efficient way. Like, you could just use wire or whatever. And he's blind. This is the other thing. He's a blind sculptor. I don't know how helpful... A, a skeleton, you know, like you're always watching these programs where, like, well, Richard III, we've reconstructed what his face looks like from the skeleton we found, you know? And you're like, okay, I mean, I guess, like, if you're like a scientist and you're doing all these mappings and stuff, maybe you can do this, but a blind sculptor working his own in, in Spain is not going to get that much out of a skeleton. I'm, and he's not like, he's not an active sculptor, like, he's in a chair, like we said, he can't move. The, the other thing is, is that. Is that they're not just killing anybody, right? They, I can't remember exactly why they kill Maho, the uh, hunchback gypsy, but I know that they're killing the beautiful ladies because he needs them for a beautiful lady uh, statue thing, right? But that implies that your skull and your bones and everything, if you just like swapped uh, clay on top of them, they would make exactly what you look like. It's like they have to be, like the women's like, they have to be exactly right, they have to be perfect, you know? And you're like, this is a skillet. But the movie's not even about that. Like, at the end of the day, like, him being, like, an evil madman who's 
mostly just sad. No, he's he's not mad at all. No, so he's no, being he's no, being controlled no, by his wife. There's actually a really sort of a sad sense. sequence where he's no. in bed and she's like going to inject him no, with like sleeping stuff he's or like, whatever. Please, no. He's like, don't do this. I wish we could go away. I'm so lonely and sad, and and you're just like, oh my god, he's trapped in this awful situation, and he doesn't even know. That's the other thing. He doesn't even know that they're murdering people. He just thinks that they're grave robbing, which is weird that he's okay with that. And this is a complex film because the wife has issues, which is are illustrated in my favorite scene of the movie, which is a crazy dream sequence involving a lot of whipping yes. and Boris Karloff turning into a mannequin and yeah. then melting. Yeah, it's uh, she has... She has issues, which is why she's doing all the murders, I suppose, which relate to the fact that, I guess, when she was a small girl, Mm -hmm. a small blonde girl, she's like a brunette. And she's a brunette now. Yeah. Um, She was whipped a lot by herself, dressed up as a Nazi, or possibly Kato from the Green Hornet. I was never quite clear. Um, And then, as a child, she saw Boris Karloff's face... Um, melt. Which was made of paper mache, then go on fire and melt. But the best thing is that she wakes up. I was going to say, this yeah, is my she, favorite part. She wakes up and, and the... Like, oh the, oh yeah, my she, god, what a horrible the, the, nightmare the, the, the mute, involving whipping. Yeah, the mute uh, servant is there and she's like, oh, 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 trying to help. It's so awful. And her reaction is to immediately bring up the whip that she sleeps with and just batter the ever-loving lo- hell out of that servant. She's like, oh, whip, 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 whip. And you're like, why are you, if you're, if whipping is like an issue for you, why, why do you would take you a, use a whip? <laughs> and why would you take a whip to bed in the first place? It doesn't. I'm terrified of clown doll. But let me just sleep with this clown doll. So when I wake up, I'm like, ah. And then yeah. I get dressed as a clown. This mo- this is a movie where there are lots of things that happen that have no payoff and, and no reason for, for like, basically happening at all like there's a whole sequence when the when like maho our our friendly dead uh, gypsy uh, hunchback there's a sequence of the children and they're like they're like maho is dead maho and they run to the queen of the gypsies did you notice that one of the kids took a huge no, face plant? there's an amazing face plant like you have like like you have to like maybe we should try and find in the movie but it's hilarious like they run they're like maho's dead he's like i as the queen of the gypsies know that he is dead and they're like oh no maho's gone and then they they walk away from the gypsies all sad it's like the music's all sad but then the music suddenly gets super happy and they're running through the streets like it's like, it's like they're free and love but then one of the kids immediately face plants I think two of them do, do they're oh, like yeah. running down a hill they're running and in a they hill. don't stop but the kid like he, he like I mean I say face plant he lands on his, on his face. face it's yeah. amazing it, it just there's just stuff like that happens there the main character, part of his scheme is that not only is he going to draw people to the town, but he's going to buy a bunch of real estate or something. <laughs> Nothing more exciting. He wants to. Than he wants to like humans. throw a party to make that happen. Um, he wants to make. It, he's kind of. He's really creepy because he's one of the things he's like, "Why don't we make it sound like an orgy? This party." And you're like, "What? what like what? Why? Like don't stop." Um, <laughs> I don't understand. The mute servant girl gets sexually assaulted. Oh my god, that's that's probably like that's when I say that's my favorite part of the film. That's not that comes across wrong, but it's kind of my favorite because it's the least important part of the film. It has no payoff, no reason to happen. They just cut away though. Like basically, what happens is during the film, related to Maho being missing, the kid talks to one of the bartenders or something, and our hero is there. But meanwhile. There's another man there. He's like a shifty looking... He's like cleaning a glass or something. He's standing there. And while he hears that Maho's been killed, he looks really shifty. Now, at this point in the film, we don't know who's committing these murders, right? So you're supposed to be like, aha, he is the killer. And earlier on, we've seen him standing in the mute. In like, uh, when she goes shopping, he chases her to the bus and he's like, oh, she got on the bus. So you're like, hmm, is he the murderer? Is he going to kill the mute servant which really makes sense because she works there anyway no actually what he wants to do is to sexually assault her and he has nothing to do with the main plot at all like he's not involved in the murders in any way he's only there as a sexual assault red herring which i think is really awful like because she is attacked you actually get to see the whole aftermath of her like standing up she's dazed like try to like like put her dress back on sort of and walk away and you're like 
that has nothing to do with anything. It's no, really it terrible. No, it never pays off. It never does anything like that. This is a movie that is repeatedly just broken by lightning. Like, the movie gets boring, and then they cut to, like, a stock shot of, like, an optical lightning going... It, it has very crazy music. I mean, we, we mentioned the, the happy, then sad, then happy music happening really fast. But it has a lot of really crazy music. There's literally a point where I think it's they kill the friend of the main characters basically to make one of the statues and before she's killed she goes into a room and she like knocks a thing over and sees like a horrible skeleton and that is accompanied by a xylophone like like <laughs> Like, <laughs> like Scoob, we're really in for it now. <laughs> There's a lot of like weird, very like doesn't fit in making you feel scared in any way. But this music. is also a movie that it looks very colorful. Like, yeah, it's poppy and like the walls are usually bright primary colors. But it's also a movie where no one really dies. Like you're waiting. There's this one woman who gets chased for like four separate times and nothing happens. Like she yeah. gets home and she's like, whew. That was scary. I mean, a drunk is murdered, yes. I suppose, but with a dart during a party. And it's... <laughs> it makes no sense. I was actually watching the screen because the drunk's like, I know what's going on. And someone just throws a dart at him and I couldn't really see the dart. Yeah. I'm like, where did he get hit with the dart? Um, but yeah, we, I mean, basically we kind of, we progress towards it in the movie. Our heroes um, knock over a statue when they're taking his bows and they see that there's bones in their armature. Um, that's kind of where they start to work out things are going wrong. Sorry, but they don't really do much. But it can't interrupt the party they're going to have. Yeah, but they just they massive. just go they just go and have a party. And in fact, um, the party's like kind of amusing because it's like you're like, what are these people dressed as? Are are the evil wife? She's definitely dressed as Kato from the Green Hornet, right? Because she has the mask and the suit. And I know it's the character from her dream, but at the same time, that's exactly what she looks like. And there's like a guy dressed as a bulldog. There's maybe a centurion, a spooky clown, a man in a jacket. You and they know, all like, get in a circle. And they, have a conga, they have a conga line, which I mean, I was like, conga line? That's, is that a thing people have ever I done? I was going to say like, that. They get in a circle and sing Three Blind Mice, which seems really offensive. And they don't even get any sound. Three Blind Mice! Three Blind Mice! They tore her apart. It was a violent, sustained gang rape. Basically, um, the, the female gang character, who we've barely mentioned, because she doesn't really do anything, she just sort of hangs around, she, uh, she gets in a huff because her friend is missing, and she leaves, and just to establish how awesome our hero is, he like she's gone missing. He leaves the party, and he's like, uh, he's like, oh, I've got to find whatever her name is. And then some other character goes, Hey, why don't you come to see the gypsies? It's some great flamenco dancing. And he goes, Oh yeah, I'll do that. If you see her, let her know I'm with the gypsies. And well, if you see her, tell her I'm with the gypsies, eh? Okay. Da, da, da. I will look on your treasures, gypsy. Is this understood? Who is this lady you have shrunk? Do not try shrink me, Gypsy. I serious. Flamenco. When am I gonna see flamenco again? And and, and again, this is the the uh, the Gypsy sequence has what I consider to be another section where our mute character shortchanged. Uh, not, I mean, obviously she wasn't just merely shortchanged, but she 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 comes back. She goes to see the Queen of the Gypsies. Um, but earlier in dialogue, as characters established. These, 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 these people have a great uh, intuition about death. So she goes to see the uh, Queen of the Gypsies because she's worked out the whole thing. And she does charades. She literally does charades to explain to the Queen of the Gypsies there's been all these murders. What, what, what are you trying to say? It's like a lassie moment. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's, what? A murder? Murder? It's, it's, Where? it's genuinely embarrassing to watch. But the Queen of the Gypsies is like, aha, now I know all the information. And then, this is my favorite thing. She invites over our hero 
and he, she starts to tell him all the information the mute gave her, but as if it was mystical gypsy stuff that she learned. She literally, like, like if I was the mute woman, I'd be like, what the fuck are you doing? I told you. She's like, yes, she will be murdered tonight. She is with them. I have worked out. It will happen at three o'clock. I mean, first of all, all the other murders have just happened immediately. Why is he waiting to yeah, do because this? Yeah, because they, they tie up the woman and they just wait for a while to kill her straight away. Every, every single other person, they have murdered in the street and they dip straight in the acid. This one, for some reason... <laughs> Why keep her alive? Yeah, exactly. Just dump her in the acid. But no, they want to keep her alive on a table for a while for no particularly good reason. Um, so at this point, our hero goes there. At the same time, Boris Karloff... The wife has forgotten to drug him or something, so he's wandering about. He learns what's going on. And then, probably the most underwhelming climax of a movie of all time. But right? wait, who is the murderer that's been helping the wife and going oh, around? Yeah. Just the Some guy. guy. Some guy. <laughs> it's the guy who our hero was going to be doing the real estate with. It's just, it's like, who cares? <laughs> yeah, you, because, because they don't even really care. I mean, he was, he was like, doing it with the wife or something. There's an there's amazing sequence where he's like, I have to pay for my car. And she gives him a check. He starts to kiss the check. And she goes, no, darling, me. And he goes to kiss her. And she goes, Sss, like a cat. And you're like, what? Like, this is, he must have been very confused by, the, by what was going on. Because at some point, she's like, give me kisses. No, don't give me kisses. I give you money. We Maybe didn't I explain don't. that the murder is also because they want to murder Boris Karloff to get his money. Yeah, it's like, I, why don't just why don't you just murder him? But he has to like finish the statues first or something. Oh, we did miss what the 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 only creepy thing in the movie, which is when Boris Karloff briefly takes his glasses off and you see his horrible scratched out eyes. I thought that was kind of gross. Did the monkey do that? No, I think the wife did it, but we're not really in, we're, like she threw, I think she put acid in his eyes. That's probably is, what it was. Was why it's all melted and gross That's looking. But his eyes are creepy. We only see for like a second. But yeah, this this underwhelming climax is. The girl fights the woman for a while, then she comes upstairs, and then Boris Karloff goes downstairs, but in the meantime, the other guy who we don't care about has gone upstairs to fight the hero, which... A yeah, Batman-style climax. But there's this sequence where, where you kind of like, I don't know, it's actually, again, it's another part of the movie where I was like, this is just embarrassing, where our Boris Karloff's like... He goes, I can see better in the dark than you can. He turns the lights out, but he basically hits one bulb and the rest of the place is still, still lit. So she's like, okay, you've got one bulb. I can see. And so she starts doing this really, I think it's kind of, even if you're fighting a blind person, I think this is a dick move. She starts to like make noises in one direction and then run in the other direction. And I'm like, ah, oh, come on, play fair. You know? And in the end, like we've barely watched this fight. Like the main, like, the main characters fight. It's like, whatever. We barely Who cares? Who cares? And so the main sort of climax is Boris Carl is fighting with the woman, and then she's like going to push him in the acid, but instead he basically succeeds in the struggle in shoving her arm in the acid, and we get a cool thing where she pulls her arm out, and it's like a skeleton arm, and she's like, Ugh. Which was also in her dream. I was it? I forget yeah, that. Because she had a dream of, as a child, a skeleton hand was being put oh, on Oh, yeah, face. so foreshadowing. 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 And then Boris Karloff is like, oh, and he just runs off a cliff. He runs off a cliff, and then again, we have some music that doesn't fit. Doesn't do, 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 do. But I love the dummy that they have, which they yeah. obviously just did one take, because it's not really in frame. It's just like at the bottom of the frame, and he dies, and which has one of my favorite visual effects. Which I think is supposed to be Boris Karloff in the ocean, but they just superimposed water yeah. <laughs> over his body, like probably just like laying down in the studio. Uh, I or thought that was like, like a psychedelic effect, you know? Because it's, I mean, yeah, I mean, and then the movie just ends, right? I mean, like the end, like, hmm, <laughs> this movie, eh? <laughs> I appreciated its '60s psychedelic kind of. I see it was always bright, it was always colorful, and it was kind of enjoyably silly but nothing really as you say nothing happens yeah and i don't think enough crazy stuff happened yeah. like if he was making like wax sculptures and maybe at the end they all came to life or something like that or the person murdering people murdered more people or we cared who it was or there was a big twist or boris karloff didn't just run off a cliff at the end like maybe that would be more interesting but as the movie stands it's just not that interesting no, it it's it's not that interesting. So does it belong in the canon canon? 
I mean, this Canon Canon is, the, the cupboards are pretty bare right now. <laughs> I would not add this to the Canon Canon. Even as the first horror film, it's clearly just, you know, it's just something they just bought for, they found in the, the garbage outside the distributors. <laughs> And they just like put it out because they were like, Fuck, we got we got we got a triple bill to put on. We'll stick a couple of pornos and we'll shove this crappy horror film on as well. Because people after they've spent after they're spent, they want to watch a horror film, maybe. Or vice versa, I don't know. Or they can like have sex while it's playing or like shoot up or you know, whatever yeah, people yeah, did. Whatever back people then did in those watch. those gross uh theaters. My name's Justin the Clue. <laughs> I was Matthew Kimmer. And you've been listening to this Yeah.